Good morning. Uh, first, let me try to justify why, for an international conference, I want to talk about the very rather parochial subject of the British nuclear power program. And I think the, the answer is that the nuclear renaissance that has been talked about for the last decade or so, there were two key markets that the nuclear industry had to crack if it was going to be successful. And one of them was the USA and the other was the UK. So I want to try and present what has happened in, in one of those markets just to, to, because if the UK and the US are not cracked, then I think the, the future for the nuclear renaissance is quite bleak. For the past nine months, the EDF and the British government have been briefing the British press that any day now, agreement would be reached between the two parties on a deal for a contract to buy the power from the new Hinkley Point B uh, European pressurised water reactor. Uh, that deal hasn't yet been concluded, but let's assume that sometime in the next six months, uh, the deal will be concluded, and you can be sure that the next day the headlines in the papers will be to the effect, good news for Britain and good news for the planet. And what I want to argue is that it actually represents a catastrophic failure of the policy process in Britain. And in more detail, what I want to argue is that if we had known in 2006 what we had to sign up for to get a contract to get this nuclear power plant built, that, pro that policy would not have lasted seconds, never mind the seven years that it's been going on. So I want to talk about what we were promised in 2006 and what we're actually going to get. Then I want to look at some of the institutions that should have stopped this process before we'd spent so long and so much money and so much opportunity cost getting this far, why they failed and how. Then look at, is the deal done? When that announcement is made, does that mean that the nuclear power plant is actually going to be built? And then what will actually happen next? So let's look at, at what we were promised. And the headlines in 2006 were no subsidies. And this was a very powerful message that uh, nuclear economics might not have been very good so far, but this time nuclear was going to have to stand on its own two feet and there would be no public subsidies. And the implication was clearly that nuclear would be competing in a, a very vigorous wholesale electricity market on equal terms, give or take a little bit of carbon price, with all the other forms of generation. What we're actually going to get is a, a contract to buy all the power from the plant for 40 years, uh, and we're not going to know the small print of that contract until it's too late. We won't know what uh, price escalators there are, what government guarantees have had to be given to get that contract signed, and more, uh, more importantly, to get the finance to build the plant. We were promised that power from this nuclear power station would be competitive with gas-fired generation and would come in at about 31 to 44 pounds a megawatt hour. All the reports, uh, press reports about the contract suggest that the actual contract price is going to be in the range of 95 to 100 pounds per megawatt hour, which is more than double the current wholesale electricity price and it's probably going to be just about the most expensive power on the system. The 2008 white paper on nuclear power, which was the detail of the policy, uh, forecast that the construction cost of this reactor would be about two billion pounds per reactor. It's quite clear now that the terms of the contract will be based on a construction cost of about seven billion pounds per reactor. When will we get some power from it? Well, uh, earlier on we were told the first power would be 2017, and I think the, uh, the head of EDF in Britain was saying that we could cook our turkeys in 2016 Christmas using the first power from this reactor. I will argue that, that actually we'll be quite lucky to get the first power from this plant before about 2023. 
We were also promised that there would be competition between developers and competition between different technologies. And ministers were talking in terms that they did not want to be uh, in the hands of a monopoly of EDF offering only the EPR. And of course, that's exactly what we're going to get. We're going to get the EPR supplied by EDF. Three consortia were set up to build nuclear power plants, one of which was uh, uh, an EDF Centrica joint venture, and that still exists, although the Centrica wheel fell off about a year ago. Uh, a second consortium was uh, the RWE Aon German a combination which uh, again bailed out about two years ago now. Uh, that consortium has been built by, bought by Hitachi, the Japanese reactor vendor, uh, and they are talking about building their technology, the ABWR, but of course that has only just started the generic design assessment process, the process where the regulator looks at the safety of the design that process takes about five or six years, so essentially at the moment that, that particular option is not, is not able to go forward. The third consortium was a consortium of uh, the French company GDF Suez, the Spanish company uh, Iberdrola, which owns Scottish Power, and the other Scottish company, Scottish and Southern, and they have been basically uh, dormant for the last few years and are very unlikely to go ahead. In terms of technologies, we started off reviewing four technologies. Two of those dropped out within a year of the process starting. A third technology, the Westinghouse AP1000, went a bit further, but when it became clear that there were no customers for that technology, they suspended the process. So we have just EDF and the EPR now. The government has talked about a program of 10 reactors, so there would be four reactors from the EDF consortium, four from the uh, Horizon Eon RWE consortium, and two from the third consortium, with a capacity of about 16 gigawatts. The likelihood is we'll get one to two reactors, which uh, with perhaps a, a tenth of that capacity. So how did we get here? There's various uh, theories about how we got here, uh, and a lot of people saw it very much in personal terms of the Prime Minister Blair, uh, who was a very early convert to the nuclear renaissance. In 2003, when there was a government white paper on energy which came down very firmly against nuclear power, it was uh, widely reported to be him that put in the loophole that said that we would keep the nuclear option open and in 2006, he preempted a, a policy review by saying that nuclear power was back with a vengeance. So it, it looks like there was very strong uh, support from above. But when Gordon Brown took over, the support did not change. Of course, some people said, well, Gordon Brown's brother, brother works for EDF, so that's how that one works. And then we had the uh, coalition government, the, the Cameron government, but again, no change in, uh, in the, the, the effort put behind the program. Some people talked about the uh, energy ministers, and there's a long history of energy ministers who uh, end their period of power going on to nice positions in nuclear industry associations. And for example, Lord Hutton is now chair of the Nuclear Industry Association but he's now been replaced by ministers from a party that was previously anti-nuclear, the Liberal Democrats, uh, Chris Hewn and now Ed Davey. And again, they've followed the same policy with the same rigor as their, as their previous uh, incumbents. So it doesn't seem like it's something that's driven by uh, policy at the very top from politicians. What about the nuclear lobby? And if you talk to anti-nuclear campaigners, they talk a lot about a nuclear lobby. And if you'd asked me 30 years ago about the British nuclear lobby, I'd have constructed a very convincing lobby made up of the Central Electricity Generating Board, government-owned electric utility that thought building nuclear power stations was much more interesting than building coal-fired power plants. The UK Atomic Energy Authority, very well-connected national uh, our nuclear R&D organization, British Nuclear Fuels Limited, 
nationally owned, very influential fuel cycle company, uh, and the national champion engineering company, uh, Arnold Weinstock's GEC. And that makes a pretty convincing uh, nuclear lobby. What those four organizations have in common is that none of them exist now, and all of them uh, disappeared long before the current policy was set up. So it does appear that there is a nuclear lobby, something with resources and organizational capability, but it's very difficult to see where it comes from. You can perhaps talk about the defense industry, but I'm not sure that's very convincing. So what about the civil service? Why didn't the civil service, why did the civil service produce such ridiculously unrealistic numbers and why are they not warning ministers that the policy is going wrong? The energy minister, uh, ministry said in 2008 that construction costs would be two billion and generation costs as little as 30 pounds a megawatt hour. So they, even five or six years ago, those were ludicrously unrealistic numbers and everybody said so. They also uncritically accepted assurances from the, cre the three consortium that they wouldn't need subsidies. Now, why wouldn't the consortium, why would the consortium say they needed subsidies? They could smell that subsidies were available and they knew that if they said, well, we can build without subsidies, when they're actually called on to deliver on that promise in five or six years later, they could say, well, we thought we could, del we could deliver without subsidies, but turns out the market has changed, finance is difficult, costs have gone up, so it looks like we are actually going to need subsidies to go ahead. But the DEC didn't, the Department of Energy and Climate Change didn't question those. We also set up an office for nuclear development within DEC, uh, and it seems to have operated in a very different way to the way you would expect civil servants to operate. It's been very much the cheerleader for nuclear power, and you'll see officials from that uh, department going around the world telling you what a great thing the British nuclear power program is. So they don't seem likely to give impartial advice to the minister. I said earlier that, that we're not going to know what we've signed up to. And we get some very, we get two conflicting statements from ministers. Uh, Ed Davey, the current Secretary of State, that's the senior minister at the Energy Department, said, under the Energy Bill, all investment contracts must be published and laid before Parliament. And that sounds very clear. We're going to know exactly what is in the contract. But if you look at his junior minister, uh, Hayes, uh, a month before, he said, it is possible that some contracts may contain detailed financial information belonging to a generator that is commercially confidential. Disclosure of such information could significantly harm the interests of a generator. One result of that would be blah, 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 blah. So parts of the contract will be uh, blanked out because they are categorized as commercially confidential and you can be sure that they are the parts of the contract that we as consumers need to know about if we're going to make a decent evaluation of the uh, contracts. So what are we signing up for? If we actually do build 10 reactors, and I don't think for one second we are, but let's say we do, and their contract is for 40 years, then we will be signing up to pay 500 billion pounds in, uh, uh, under the terms of those contracts. That's about 10,000 pounds per person in Britain. Now, sometimes we have to sign up for big things if we want to achieve big things. Uh, but that sort of amount of money needs to be properly scrutinised. People in Parliament, all the checks and balances should have noticed that and should be looking very seriously at it. There is a parliamentary uh, uh, par uh, House of Commons Energy Committee and they have sporadic uh, inquiries, but their results are always equivocal. The, the chair is not always clear what his position is, and they've not really had any impact on the program. The watchdogs for public spending, the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons, and the National Audit Office work on an ex-post uh, uh, ex basis. Ex-post? Yeah, 
ex post, not ex ante. Uh, so they will look at the, the thing when the deal is done. So it's too late. The damage will have been done by the time they get to look at the contract. The Environmental Audit Committee, which is interested in that, has very little political power, so they're not going to make much difference. The Treasury, which is, of course, always the powerhouse in any government, is again has been involved very late in it, and they are deeply involved in the negotiations by all accounts, and they're trying to get the best deal now, but it's much too late. They, they needed to be involved three or four years ago if they were going to make any sort of change. If we do get an agreement, does that mean that something will happen? Well, we have to get past European Union law. And the contract will be declared illegal if it's deemed to be illegal state aid. There are three tests for that. Is it state aid? Yes, it clearly is state aid. There is a benefit, and it's provided by the state. And for these purposes, consumers are the state. Does it distort the market? Yes, of course, it distorts the market. It will take something like 35 to 40 percent of the electricity market away and take it away from a competition. Is there an applicable, applicable exemption for state aid for nuclear power? Now, this is more interesting. Renewables are not subject to state aid legislation. There is a block exemption for them. And this year, those, the energy guidelines are being reviewed, uh, and there is a very strong possibility, and there is strong lobbying, that these guidelines become so-called technology neutral. In other words, nuclear will allow, be allowed to be subsidized under these new re regimes, in which case the state aid issue disappears. And there, are, there is a strong lobby. There's some interesting arithmetic in the European Union. There is a group of 12 friends of nuclear power that meet every year uh, to see how they can uh, go forward with nuclear power. And these countries are very interested in the British uh, contracts because it's an option that they would like to have open for them if they go forward with their nuclear power program. The British government is keeping the Commission informed and it wants to try and get away with a fast-track um, inquiry which will only take two or three months. But I think the, the precedent set by the British um, programme is such. I mean, the fact that other countries might want to take it up it is so strong that I think it would be difficult to get away without a very rigorous inquiry which could take two or three years. What about EDF? Most people assume that EDF is the French government, therefore has unlimited resources and can do whatever it likes. That's not true. EDF is, has shareholders, a minority 15%. Its debts are far too high to be sustainable. Its credit rating is going down. It's selling things like it sold the networks in southeast England because it needs to reduce its debts. And taking on a £14 billion investment, if it's at all risky, is not something that will go sit well with the credit rating analysts. It could drop the uh, EDF's credit rating another notch. If the new French uh, president, Hollande's objective of getting nuclear down to 50% is carried through, and that's a big if, then um, EDF doesn't need EPR. And the whole raison d'etre of the EPR is that it was built, it was designed so that it could replace the French nuclear power plants, which will reach the end of their expected life in about 20, from about 2017 onwards. If you don't need a technology to replace them, and if you can life extend some of them, retire others and replace with renewables, then the French government's policy of, of pushing the EPR doesn't look very sensible. What will happen now and what can we learn from it? Well, I think the government will do all it can to force the contract through. It's spent seven years getting us this far and it's not going to say, whoops, sorry, that was a mistake, uh, we've actually done the wrong thing. It won't pull back now. And consumers will pay for this. And I, and I think it's, it's a shame that no politician had the courage to actually say, or no politician with enough influence to make a difference that the emperor had no clothes in this respect. So is that the end for the nuclear industry? And I think um, 
I've seen enough of the nuclear industry to know that the nuclear industry does not lay down and die very easily. And I think it's very likely that in another 10, year, 10 or 15 years' time, the nuclear industry will come forward with a new set of technologies and say, well, look, the technologies you had so far were a bit expensive. They weren't quite as, expen as safe as you thought we thought they were going to be, but you're going to love these technologies because they're safe and cheap. And a new generation of credulous politicians will fall for it, and we'll go through this whole cycle again. So I'm sorry for a rather... Uh, depressing end to my presentation, but that's because I, I'm an old academic and I can't see any future. <laughs>